Coming to you from the cinema lounge of the Carolina Asheville, it's the latest bastards go to the movies, featuring Ken Hanke. Hello. And Justin Souther. Hi. So, this has actually been a fairly light week in terms of movie viewing for both of you. Let's start with a film that you had uh, pretty mixed emotions about, it seems like. So tell me about Like Crazy. What is it? It's a romance between a couple of college-age people, um, and it has its merits. There are things about it that I like. There are things about it that I hate. Um, I hate, you know, it, it, it's like, will somebody please tell these people making these indie films that I, too, have seen Breathless. I know what a jump cut is, and I don't need to see it again. When you are doing something that by now, even Tyler Perry has done, it ain't edgy. Is it supposed to be edgy? Yes. It's supposed to show you how hip they are. Now. Do they hide the camera they're... behind plants? No. Okay, well, at least they don't have that. Then... There is the tinkly piano, if you get near a tune, play it score, which is no score at all. It's like random notes with the occasional chord. There is no music, it's just someone doodling on a piano. It's not good for the piano. It depends. Some pianos may find it very enjoyable indeed. Anyway. The biggest problem with the movie, other than the fact that Anton Yelchin is supposed to be this design whiz who, as near as I can determine, only ever designs the same chair over and over again, and it looks like, well, a chair. There's nothing particularly interesting about this chair. Have you sat in it? I have not sat in it. That is perhaps the problem. But the bigger problem is that what you have is this British girl who, because she can't stand to go two weeks without Anton Yelchin, figure that one out, overstays her visa and then is shocked, shocked, I tell you, when she comes back to the country and they slap her in a detention room and send her back home because she violated her visa the first time she was here. Well, I'm not coming in as a student this time, but I'm coming in as a tourist. Duh. Now, That said, I like the fact that it does work on the assumption, which in my experience is true, that in every relationship there is someone who loves and someone who is loved in unequal proportion. And in this case, it's Felicity Jones who loves Anton Yelchin and Anton Yelchin, who is fine with this but is by no means on the same wavelength of obsession that she is. And I don't think I've really ever seen that, other than in movies that end up with somebody being stalked and shot in a bathroom after boiling somebody's pet rabbit. I don't think I've ever seen that really depicted in a movie before, and I thought that was interesting. And I I like the two players. I don't particularly like their characters because I think they're both too dumb to live. But uh, just for that one aspect of it, and and the fact that I also kind of like Jennifer Lawrence in the film as Yelchin's good enough for now girlfriend that he dumps at least twice during the course of the film to go back to you know Felicity Jones and and she takes it both times which I also think is probably pretty true I've seen this before you know, the, the, I would have to say that the, the reason I think all this is true is because I have been in each of these positions at one time or another so I can kind of believe that it is reality of its own. So would you recommend this film generally or would you just say that for certain I would say generally I would recommend this film yes Uh, but bearing in mind that it has problems oh my it has problems Another film that you had that you saw that had (coughs) problems and you had sort of mixed feelings on uh, is the unwieldy Martha Marcy May Marlene I've decided that that is in in point of fact Martha Marcy May Adele Brunch Suzet but that's only for people who have seen The Bank Dick. Okay. No, actually, I have no mixed feelings about this film. I hated it. Really? Uh, I do not say it's a bad film. I say that I personally hated it. Uh, The representative from Fox, and I'll be interested to see if Fox sends me any more screeners, 
um, asked if she could quote me exactly, and I said, sure, without thinking, because quoting me exactly was, it's a badly photographed, dreary little movie about dreary little people that I didn't care anything about. How do you really feel about it? That's pretty much how I really feel about it. However, let's bear in mind that I am very much in a minority on this one. And it, essentially it is this girl played by Elizabeth Olsen, and she's good, though she's not, this is not the star-making turn. How's it going to be a star-making turn? Fifteen people are going to see this damn movie. And, and for clarification, I think a lot of the surprise at Elizabeth Olsen here Here's is the that fact that she's an Olsen. Right. That she's, she's a younger sibling of, of the separated at birth twins. You know, and that, that's, that's perhaps her only claim to fame, actually. Um, but she wasn't bad in this, it sounds like. She's not bad in the film, but at the same time, the character is pretty much... Well, they picture her as so damaged and so confused that partway through I'm thinking, no, this girl's just simple-minded. Um, I don't The photography is terrible. They can light something if it's in the bright sunlight, but God forbid they have bright sunlight behind something. And, and they're in shadow because they have no idea how to shoot this, and they've never heard of fill lighting. So you've got, you know, this murk, and then a perfectly exposed background, which is not what I want to see. Um, so the premise is essentially that this girl is part of this sort of Manson-like, Manson family-like... I would call them a really bargain like, basement Manson cult, because it's not even clear what they're doing. So it's a, But it's a cult of some kind. Yes. And she leaves the cult to go back to her sister? Yes. And, and badly, and isn't good at adapting back. The cult isn't having any of that, I assume. Well, the, the, that's unclear as to whether the cult really isn't having any of that, or if it's all in her mind, mind, mind. Sounds dumb. Well, it... When you put it like that... Well, that's what it uh, comes so down it, to. How, how do you think a cult is after you? Uh, you have fantasies that they're, that people you run into are actually members of the cult. Oh, so she's just paranoid. yes. So you didn't like it? You didn't I didn't it. like it, but a lot of people did, so don't take my word for it. Go see for yourself. You too can either, you can either think I'm wrong or you can hate it. Justin, you saw a movie this week. I did see a movie. Crazy Feet. No, Happy Feet. Happy Feet 2. Happy Feet 2, yes. yes. The yes. sequel to the, to the animated film about a dancing penguin. Happy Feet 1. Right. As it's now what will be called. Which I never saw. Can you... I've seen it. It was massively okay. This one's massively not so a okay. mess. I have nothing to really... Isn't there a foot care product called... Ha no, it's called Pretty Feet. Never mind. I don't you, know enough about foot care. You used to rub it on to slough off dead skin. Nope. And in your review, you actually went to great lengths to point out how incoherent large portions right. of this film actually right. are. So what's the premise of Happy Feet 2? Um, there's a big iceberg that traps a bunch of penguins... And they're going to die unless someone figures something out. Do they tap dance while they're dying? No, they tap dance at the end to save them. Oh. Because. Let's hear about these musical numbers. What are they? Well, there's a big medley at the beginning that's in, that's in the trailer. If you've seen the trailer, you've seen I, I have seen the, the trailer, but I blocked it from my mind. Well, you should go watch it again. Too. No. And then there's a few scattered here and there, and then there's one at the end, and that's pretty much it. I mean, there's not... Well, are they recognizable pop songs? Yeah, or, you know, it's, it's Janet Jackson, and there's a few Queen songs, and um, LL Cool J, but... What Queen songs? This might tip the scales for me. Um, we Will Rock You. No, okay, that's not helping. I forget, that might be the only one. I oh, well. I, no. like I lost interest pretty quick. Because this movie sucks. Unlike the average American, you cannot get Justin Souther's attention just by showing him a penguin. No. Well, I think you're leaving out the importance of the two Krill characters. Yeah. Well, that was occasionally the only sort of like interesting part of the film because you have a Brad Pitt Krill who has decided to leave the rest of his Krill so he can evolve and become a greater Krill. Like a shrimp or something, maybe? I don't know. He decides he wants to be a carnivore and explore the world. And then you have the Matt Damon Krill, which is much more wanting to go back. He, he follows Brad Pitt around, and, but he wants to get back to the rest of their friends. 
And there's a, a weird angle of where the Matt Damon character is obviously in love with Brad Pitt. And they, they, there's no bones made about what their sex is. Like, they even talk about he's trying to convince him to Do adopt. Do Krill have sex? I don't know. Okay. Probably. They probably just... Maybe they fertilize eggs or something. I, I don't know. I have no idea. I don't... I mean, they bring up, like, adopting a, some baby krill since they can't procreate. But, I mean, there's not much to it. It's, like, 30 seconds of the movie. Well, yeah, I mean, as far as that goes, the, the, the whole subtext of the penguin who was different of the first mm-hmm. film, there was... there was you, you had to be an absolute moron not to get it. Well... That's not the case this time. There's not really... I mean, that's as close as we get to subtext. The rest of it's just sort of like... Believe in yourself kind of thing. But there's like five different points to this movie. None of them really work. Well, there's climate change. That, that, that has to figure out. They don't even like really talk about. Like, it's not like, oh, this is a big issue. It's just, oh, this thing happens. Well, I should, you know... Need to bring in an animated Al Gore with a PowerPoint. Yes. That would liven things up no end, I'm sure. I have a feeling for this next one. This next, I think I think we're going to hear nothing but sunlight and sparkles from you as you review The Twilight Saga, Breaking Dawn Part 1. I think that I'm optimistic. You like the director? You you there, there are things about the cast you do, you do. You're a big you're a Twilight, I think. Ken is actually wearing his Twilight shirt. So let's hear about The Twilight Saga. Breaking well, it's Dawn. the most interestingly stylishly made of the entire series. Which is that really saying much? No, it isn't in a way. Although White's, Chris White's did, did use some nice color in his entry. But, I mean, this one is just, this, this thing is art directed out the ass. And uh, I hate to be a uh, one to stereotype, but I could not help watching like the way the wedding was done and not be reminded of a line out of Boys in the Band, which is, oh, Mary, it takes a fairy to make something pretty. It starts on a note of just rampant insanity, which is, it opens with Jacob, the wolf boy, running out of the house, tearing his shirt off so that the girls can get a look at his gym rat body dropping the wedding invitation to go to Bella and Edward's wedding, bursting out of his clothes and turning into one of those Buick-sized CGI werewolves and running off into the woods for God knows whatever reason. So he just runs off into the woods? That's it, yeah. yeah. And then, well, apparently he, he, later, he later says he thinks he was in Canada. So he just he apparently just ran. ran around the woods for several weeks. Nobody noticed the giant no, wolf in the no. woods? And then there's a really good sequence where Edward, and I think this is kind of ripped off from other sources, confesses that at one time, I'd say it's 1935 because it starts out by watching Bride of Frankenstein uh, in a movie theater, rebelled and lived the life of a real vampire. But it is made very clear that he only killed people who were stalking women with an eye to kill them. Does he know they are? He's following them. So he's following them and assumes? Do yeah, they have proof that they like have a knife out on them or they're... they're you know, it's, it's fairly, they haven't done anything. They haven't done anything, but he's, so he's, he's like he's the a fascist Batman sort of, of, the, of the sparkly right. vampire world. But anyway, the, the whole thing is is that, okay, what you've got here is... Why would you want to... What, the what, blood what, of, my question is, is why would you want to, first off, recall Bride of Frankenstein, which is a far better movie right. than this one, and in so doing, recall your own Gods and Monsters, which is equally a far better movie than the one you're making. This is not my idea of a wise move. You just reminded me of two movies I could be watching rather than this piece of shit. How many Twilight fans are going to watch Bride of Frankenstein Well, I don't now? care. That's not the point. Do you think any of them are? No. Oh, maybe. I don't know. There's probably somebody that has remarkably varied taste running from the brilliant to the vapid. I don't know. I just want a strict Twilight fan to be like, oh, I really need to know. Why was that movie we saw clips of? Let me go see it. Yeah, well, you may have a point there, but that, 
That's neither here nor there. I'm not reviewing it as a Twilight fan. I'm reviewing the damn thing as me. I was asking you a hypothetical question. Well, I don't Ken. care. I don't care. Well, fine, I still I think it's it. stupid to invoke I, two better I'm not movies. I'm saying it's not stupid. Anyway, the wedding is okay. It's in cleverly added to. Then we can get to the the honeymoon. The honeymoon is a disaster of stupidity because in the first place it's boring. In the second place, the, well, that's the problem with the whole film is there's like 50 minutes of plot and two hours of movie. This is what happens when you stretch one thin book out to, or at least thin in terms of content, book out to two movies worth. You, know, you get to see them play chess. You also get to see them make Which another $140 million next year. Um, well, I was going to say, them playing chess is probably <coughs> the most improbable thing in the entire film with giant Well, werewolves. I mean, the whole problem is that this is a movie that, you know, that has a leading lady who already looks like a walking corpse. It appears that Edward can't have sex without going just absolutely ape. So, I mean, we get to see him crush the bed. And then we tactfully don't watch the rest of it. But in the morning, the entire room is trashed. Now, this will no longer apparently be a problem once she turns into a vampire. But I don't see how this is going to change the property damage aspect of it. No matter. The whole thing is a... Maybe he just stops having... The whole thing is like this excuse for spousal abuse. Because it's like, oh yeah, he's she's all banged and bruised up, but she doesn't care because Edward did it and she loves Edward. My theory was always that he would just stop having sex with her <laughs> when she turns into a vampire because that's not exciting for him. Oh, well, that's not it's the... Like, oh, that's not the way this is handled. He'll get in, fat. Any, in any case, in any, well, in any case. He'll be pregnant barefoot. Well, she's already pregnant. This is the amazing thing, because for a dead guy, this guy's got some lively sperm, let me tell you. And they didn't even know it was possible. But of well, course, I mean, this, is gonna, this, threat, this is a life-threatening thing. Well, the he real takes question, her back. It has like, the greatest line in the world, right. and it is exactly what you would expect from Taylor Lautner. He sees pregnant Bella uh -huh. and turns on Edward and goes, You did this! Well, like, yeah. <laughs> so there is the vampiric C-section in this, I take it? Yes. How was that? Did it live up to your hopes and dreams? No, it's sort of tasteful-ish. Hey, this, movie, this movie, however, is much more bloody than anything in the previous films, which, of course, has the parents going, oh, I don't know, I think this goes too far, which proves, among other things, that parents aren't reading these damn books. Yeah. Um, and then again, you have other people who really want to see what happened before we woke up the next morning and saw the trashed bedroom. They want some hot Edward on Bella action, you see, whatever. You gave this film two and a half stars out of five. So, I mean, by definition, middle of the road, which for you in this series is, not, is actually- That is not middle of the road to me. That's not, it's, I mean, quite it's literally the, mid, the median you can yeah, give that, it. it. Yes, and if you put that on a grading system, that's 50%, which is an F. <laughs> Anything lower than three and a half is not recommended. But, it, but what I'm saying is that for this series, that's actually a really good review coming from you. Yeah, I think it's a whole half star higher than the last one. Yeah. You know, it's not it's not a good movie, but it, I was largely entertained by it, not always for the reasons that were intended. So, I mean, it, it's, it, is, it is not a good movie, no. But it's a pretty movie. It has a few good sequences, and it's unintentionally pretty funny. Except that it also has long stretches of tedium. So if, if this was cut down to, say, 90 minutes, do you think it would be better? Oh, yeah, it'd be hysterical. 